24 hours a day, seven days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Good Friday, the church reflects on the ultimate sacrifice. God's Son nailed to a cross to save a world lost in sin and darkness. From St. Peter's Basilica, the liturgical remembrance of the events surrounding the suffering and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Commemoration of the Lord's Passion with Pope Francis. Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern on EWTN. Live Truth, Live Catholic. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition. And this is a Bible study show. At this, in these episodes, we are dealing with the topic of sin and using a book that I wrote uh, to help us. First of all, I recommend uh, that you have a Bible. This is a Bible study. Of course you should have a Bible. Bring it with you. I know that's something that they do in Protestant churches. It's a good idea. Learn, listen, and uh, use your Bible. Uh, I myself prefer to use the Ignatius Bible, second, the RSV Catholic uh, edition. You can get that at EWTN's Religious Catalog. It's item number 9369. And, of course, for any of these things, just go to EWTNRC.com or call them 1-800-854-6316. Now, for the, the first few months of this program, we're using a book that I wrote, which was a Bible study about sin. My title for the book was Sin, I'm Against It, But Sometimes I Forget. But the editors didn't like that title, so they call it Winning the Battle Against Sin, Hope-Filled Lessons from the Bible. This will be helpful. I'm I'm going through some of the materials in that. And if you want something of a study guide, you can either take really good notes or you can get that also at EWTNRC.com. It's item 2250. Now, of course, you can watch this show on your television uh, on Tuesdays. It's live at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Then you can see it again on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time or Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Also, you can watch the show live online. Just have to go to EW10.com or go to Facebook.com. EWTN online. It's another place. It's a good way to use Facebook. Watch this network. Or you can go to youtube.com slash EWTN and you'll have it all there. Now, of course, we also love getting questions and we'll get them th- throughout the show uh, from Facebook and YouTube as well as through email. The email for this program is scripture and tradition at EWTN.com. Or you can call in with your questions or comments during the live broadcast, again on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The phone number to call in, we'd love getting your calls, is 1-800-221-9460. 
Uh, that is if you're in North America. If you are not in North America, then the phone number is uh, national code one, area code 205 271 2980. And if you call in from outside North America, we'll try to push you up to the front of the line so we can get hold of you. All right, before we jump, jump into the scriptures, I want to answer a Facebook question um, regarding last week's uh, show uh, from uh, dealing with Genesis. Uh, the question, Father Pacwa, is it normal to fear God after we sin? It's from Jean Paradiso. Yes, <laughs> though it's not normal enough. Uh, too many people are willing to commit sins without fearing God. And this is something that uh, happens way too often. That, but that was the serpent's first trick to Adam and Eve. Oh, nothing will happen to you. You won't die. Denying that there is a bad result from sin. Nothing bad. Go ahead, drink too much. You don't get hangovers. What a bunch of dopes to believe that. Um, you know, that this is something that, uh, of course, there are consequences, and fear of God is one of them. So that, that and with good reason, because we offend God, and we put our souls in uh, great danger, and a lot of people don't like to hear that. Well, God is all merciful. Yes, he is. And he's more merciful than you are willing to be as good as you should be. However, you don't become presumptuous about God's mercy. Oh, he'll forgive me. Not if you're not sorry. Not if you don't repent. That's why Jesus said, repent and believe. So, yeah, fear of God is a good thing. In fact, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe me, take a look at Isaiah chapter 11, uh, beginning with, well, it begins with verse 1, but verses 2 and 3 in particular. And you'll see where the fear of God is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we ought to have that. All right, remember, you can be a, a member of the Scripture and Tradition Facebook group. Are there, do they have those rings yet, the decoder rings and the secret handshakes? I don't think so, anyway, so we haven't developed that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a free membership. All I have to do is uh, sign up uh, for the face group. Facebook group, and you can watch replays of the show and stay connected with over 3,000 other members who are involved in active discussions about the topics we discuss here each week. All you have to do is go to facebook.com slash groups slash EWTN Bible study. Facebook.com slash groups slash EWTN Bible study. And also, if you look on there, if you want, I know they got a lot of stuff in the news about Facebook right now. You can go into some of the controls and click on there so they can't use your personal information. Okay? That's an option. They don't tell you. It's in the, if you read all those notices and rules at the beginning, which most of us don't, uh, you'll find that out. But yeah, that's an option. So don't worry about signing for Facebook and having uh, President Trump, uh, Senator Trump, uh, Clinton or anybody else use your secret information. All right. <laughs> it's crazy with some of the stuff that they do selling our information, right? All right. We are dealing with chapter three of my book, Winning the Battle Against Sin. Now, the type, title of this chapter is Why We Needed a Divine Savior. Why do we need the Savior to be God? Why can't it be somebody, just one of us? That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door trying to convince you of. They want you to believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael, who looked like a human being. And they go door to door, and they're very committed to doing that. They do a lot of Bible studies in their churches. So why do we need it? Well, first of all, is it true 
that God became flesh and connects his divine nature and human nature with this crucifixion? That's the first question. And I say yes. Let's take a look at a, a, a few passages in Scripture that deal with this. First, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. Our Lord asks the disciples a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Remember that? Now notice, he's calling himself the Son of Man. That is a title that comes from the book of Daniel chapter 7, where the Messiah is given the title, the Son of Man. So Christ is taking that on. And so he says, what, what do people say? What's, uh, survey says what? And in that democratic approach, where you take an opinion poll about what everybody thinks, they, they say, well, some say he's Jeremiah, some say Elijah, or one of the prophets. In other words, the democratic approach to figuring out who Jesus is, taking a vote on it, is wrong. All those answers are incorrect. So then Jesus says to them in verse 16, um, or actually verse 15, who do you say I am? Speaking to you, plural, to the apostles. That's sort of a committee approach. That's what we expect out of Congress or something. And they don't have a committee re report on this. It is Peter who speaks up, uh, inspired by the Father. And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you'll see Messiah. Um, in, uh, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Notice the answer that Peter gives, you are the Messiah or the Christ. Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew, means one who has been anointed. And the same is true of Christos in Greek. Christ means the one who's anointed. And when Jesus hears the right answer, which comes by revelation, not by taking a vote, not by a committee discussing it or how you feel about it. It's rather what Jesus answers is in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. That's the source of this knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. And then it goes on. You know, to, and we don't want to go into this too much, but it says, uh, as a result, uh, and I tell you, ante kefa wa al kefa dinna ebna kinesia shali, which is Aramaic, for you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Why did I say it in Aramaic? Not to show off. Though I do that too. <laughs> but the issue... The issue is, in Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke, and he called Peter Kepha, which is translated as Petros. Take a look at uh, the, epistle, or the uh, Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verse 42, where it says, Petros translates uh, Kepha. Kepha means rock. Not, and, and you get all this little stuff going on. Well, Peter, Petros, means a little rock, and Petra, the other word on this rock I'll build my church, means a big rock. <clears throat> it's, both words are, can mean big rock or small rock in Greek poetry. So no, no, no. There are poems where Petros means a small rock, and there are poems where Petra means a small rock, and vice versa, okay? So no, 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 don't go there. Um, and the word, the word that Christ used was kepha. We see Peter call kepha, or usually kephas. When they make it into uh, Greek writing, they add the S there, so it, it sounds like a masculine noun instead of a feminine noun. But kepha is a masculine noun in Aramaic, 
but Greek, uh, if it ends in an A sound, they think it sounds feminine. So they put an S on there. They do that with Lucas and a lot of other names. And the uh, Kepha means a crag of rock. It doesn't just mean a boulder or a big stone or something like that. It means a crag of rock. It shows up in the book of Job in Hebrew as Kaif. Um, this is a, a word that is used in Semitic languages. Uh, and uh, that's what he calls Peter. And again, the visuals there at Caesarea, Mar uh, Caesarea Philippi is that there's a huge solid rock cliff behind them. It's about 90 feet high. And that's the rock, the crag of rock that they see when Jesus says that. And if you go up to the top, on the top, there's a tiny little chapel built on there, you know, that symbolizes that. So that's about Peter, and we, we know about it. But that's not the point I want to emphasize today. I just mentioned it because we brought it up, and some of you will ask. Um, what's more important for our topic about the need for God to become flesh and to save us is that right after Jesus accept, you know, accepts that, yes, I'm, you know, this is who I am, the Messiah, the Son of God, as Peter had said by the Father's inspiration, and he changed Peter's name and identity, which he didn't do for the other disciples, just Peter. Then he goes on in um, uh, uh, verse 21, and says, and introduces a brand new topic that he had not mentioned before in the gospel. Once they realized, uh, and Peter says he's the son of God, then Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So immediately after it is revealed that he's the Son of God, then Jesus begins to teach about the necessity of going to Jerusalem to die. His divinity and his saving action through death are linked together. We see the same thing going on in the Gospel of St. John, where there are also three different predictions of the death of Jesus on the cross. And especially, uh, the one I want to focus on right now is the second one, which occurs in a section where Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7 and John 8. This is the autumn festival that they have every year. And the um, uh, people... Uh, you know, go on to, to teach there in chapter 8, verse 24 of John. I told you, he says to the fo folks, I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Now, the translations say, I am he. That's, the word he is not there. In Greek, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Remember what that means. I am is the name that the Lord God revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. When he asks his name, I am. And I am who I am is his name. And so now Jesus says here in John 8, 24, um, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. It is necessary to believe that the Lord God who revealed himself at the burning bush is now revealing himself in Jesus. Or else you're going to die in your sins. It's not an option. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are making terrible mistakes as others who deny Jesus' divinity. This gets repeated a little bit later on in John chapter 8, verse 58, where Jesus says, Before Abraham came to be, I am. 
Now, the word came to be is genetai. It's a totally different word. And here, but he says, before Abraham came to be, ego emi, I am. This is an absolute claim. And by the way, the only other place where you see, the, or the first time anyway, that Jesus says, I am, as an absolute statement, is when he is walking on the water during the storm on the Sea of Galilee. It's in all four Gospels. He, again, they say, I am he. No, it says, I am. Because in the Old Testament, only God, the Lord, walks on water. And then Jesus does so. And he says, fear not, I am. This is key. But then, at the same time that he's giving them these verses, he also um, says in verse 26, John chapter 8, verse uh, 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 28, I'm sorry, verse 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak as the Father told me. In other words, when I'm lifted up on the cross, this is where he's talking about the cross for the second time, and he says, when you lift him up, and then know that I am. In other words, it is God who has died on the cross. And this is essential for our faith. All right, we're going to continue to pursue this. We'll take a little break right now, and we'll come back and continue with this theme. So please stay with us. EWTN News Nightly in Washington, D.C. I'm Wyatt Goolsby with an EWTN News Link. A new poll says President Trump's approval rating is rising. 42% of Americans say they approve of the job he's doing, up seven points from last month. But overall, 58% disapprove. Russian President Vladimir Putin declares tomorrow a national day of mourning. It's in honor of the 64 people, many of them children, who died in a fire in a shopping mall in Siberia. Putin laid flowers at a memorial. He says the disaster was caused by criminal negligence. Today is the second anniversary of the death of Mother Angelica, the founder of EWTN. Rita Rizzo was born in Canton, Ohio, and entered the convent at age 21. The network aired its first television program in August of 1981. It now reaches more than 260 million homes around the world. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and join us this evening for EWTN News Nightly. It is the most important Mass of the liturgical year, the Great Vigil of Easter, the night Christ rose from the dead. It is on this radiant night that our Lord gives us a share in His resurrection. From St. Peter's Basilica, the Easter Vigil Mass with Pope Francis, Saturday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. On Calvary's cross, the Lamb is lifted, and His precious blood is spilled. Crowned with thorns, He bore our sins in His outstretched arms, our redemption paid in full. From the Basilica of the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, Liturgy of the Lord's Passion from Washington, D.C. Friday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. First of all, I want to mention something that I'm sure you, if you've been seeing other programs during the day on EWTN, you would notice that today is the anniversary of the death of Mother Angelica. That year, it was Easter Sunday. And I'll, I'll never forget, there's something of entering into the passion of Christ, his suffering, that was part of her death and sickness. Remember, she had her stroke on Christmas Eve of 2001. She 
all of a sudden on Good Friday, she'd been fairly comfortable for most of those years. But then on that Good Friday, two years ago, her bones just cracked because, you know, they, she, they had gotten so weak over, you know, being in bed and all the other problems going on. And she was in excruciating pain. They never heard her scream like that from pain because they just were crumbling. And then on Holy Saturday, it was quiet. The pain returned on Easter. They celebrated Mass with her. And then at 5 o'clock Easter Sunday, she died. And it really was going through that uh, the, the beginning of that, her, her cerebral hemorrhage on uh, Christmas Eve, and then all that suffering going on uh, and intensifying on Good Friday, quiet on Saturday, like our Lord was quiet in the tomb, and then the final uh, pain on Easter, and then going to be with the Lord, presumably. Though, keep this in mind. Mother Angelica said, you better pray for my soul after I die. I know the sins I've committed. You better pray for me or else I'll make sure you spend more time in purgatory. <laughs> okay, okay, we're praying, we're praying. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, you know I, we all very much miss her. I, you know, <laughs> as I still haven't stopped um, uh, teasing her. Uh, if you also remember a couple of weeks later, I had a heart attack and one of my friends said, yeah, I think it was Mother Angelica's prayers that had you survive. She told Jesus, give me a break. I've only been here without him for two weeks. I don't want him here yet. We can't put up with it. So, you know, even after death, we can tease each other. But God rest her and, you know, just see the tremendous work that continues on after her. And we're delighted to be part of it. All right, we are taking this topic of Jesus speaking about his divinity and his death. And that we're seeing this goes together in the Gospel of Matthew as well as in the Gospel of, and it's also in Luke and, and Mark, but I just use Matthew as the clearest example, but also in John. All four Gospels have that link to Christ's divinity and Messiahship and his death. And I also just want to mention in John's Gospel, we were talking about John 8, before, but if you take a look at the first prediction of his death, that was given in John chapter 3. Um, he began that by speaking about himself in John 3, 13, we're speaking to Nicodemus. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So this is something that he speaks about himself. And then immediately after speaking about himself as having that time of intimacy with the Father, where he and the Father know each other because he was in heaven before he became man. Then we also see in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In other words, having belief in Christ when he is hanging on the cross, like the serpent was hanging in that tree when Moses made the bronze serpent in Numbers 21. Uh, so also, we must have faith in Jesus who has gone up to heaven and come back down. Right? And then the third prediction is in John 12, uh, verse 32, uh, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And this is something that he says immediately after he had prayed, Father, glorify your name. And the Father speaks up to him and says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. So this connection of him and the Father and that Jesus is I am, that is, that he is the Lord God, is associated with the three predictions of his death on the cross in John's gospel. And it's the same pattern that we see in Matthew. But it's not only in the gospels. 
Take a look at St. Paul. And one of the passages uh, I think that's key is Philippians chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped at. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So that here he had this form of divinity and he emptied himself of the glory of heaven and of all those perfections of heaven, became human, fully human as well as fully divine and was obedient even to the point of death. And because of that, in verse 9, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This confession that Jesus is Lord, because of his obedience until death on the cross, Paul is also linking the death of Jesus with the divinity of Jesus. And we need to see that. And by the way, in this section here, St. Paul is actually quoting an ancient hymn that was sung in the church. This wasn't some new teaching he gave them. This was a hymn they already knew. You can't tell in the English translation, but in Greek it has the rhythm of hymns. You know how you have a meter in a hymn or poetry? That's what's in there because it was an ancient hymn. And it's also a quotation of the book of Isaiah chapter 45 in which it says of the Lord God, every knee shall bend on the heavens and on the earth and under the earth. What is applying to the Lord God in Isaiah 45 now applies to, the, to Jesus Christ who is called Lord. And because of that, we have a tradition in the church that was especially made popular by Dominicans over the centuries, that when we hear the name of Jesus, we bow our heads. This is a very old tradition. A lot of people who didn't have the nuns. I had Franciscans. They still taught us that. They weren't jealous of the Dominicans. They, they told us it was Dominican, too. They didn't make that up. Um, but it was um, uh, something that is, it should be part of our devotion to the holy name of Jesus. If all the angels and everybody else on earth bows at the head of Jesus, we should do the same. And that's also why it sickens me when I hear the name of Jesus, the holy name of Jesus, being used in vain. Even on national public radio, they say it. In movies, on other TV shows. The shame is on them for misusing the holy name of Jesus. And I think there's a second commandment about taking the Lord's name in vain. Then we'll just have to, again, instill a little bit more the fear of the Lord about using the holy name of Jesus. I, had a, I was uh, over in hunting camp a few uh, a couple months ago, and one of the kids, uh, teenagers, was with his dad, and he was using our Lord's name. And I just got on his uh, case pretty seriously about, you know, I'm, you and your dad work out some of the other bad words, but when you use the name of Jesus Christ in vain, that happens. <laughs> Stuff falls down. So don't allow that to happen. Amen? All right. <sighs> Where are we here? All right. As I was saying, we're talking about St. Paul. And I also mentioned in Colossians chapter 1, we see the same link where it says in verse 19, for in him that is in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The, fu the fullness of divinity, theotetes, that the fullness of divinity was pleased to dwell in him. He has the fullness of all divinity. 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That fullness of divinity that is mentioned here in verse 19 is immediately followed in verse 20 by he is the one who then uh, makes peace by the blood of his cross. The link is direct. So it's not just something I see once, it's repeated. This is what we have to uh, emphasize to other folks, so that when we were estranged and hostile of mind, hostile of mind doing evil deeds, now he has reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. Provide with one thing, one thing. Provided that you remain stable and steadfast and continue in the faith. Again, just as in John, if you believe that I am, you can be saved, especially as he hangs on the cross. Paul makes the same connection here, that you must believe in Christ's divinity, and that he died, and then you can be saved from your sins, okay? So these are very key points. Uh, next week we'll go uh, to, to more, but we want to deal with some of your questions. Uh, let's go over here to a question from youtube.com slash EWTN, where it says, Father Mitch, I know a lot of people who don't believe in the sacrament of reconciliation, but are content with sinning and having the Protestant outlook of saying, I pray to God forgive, for, to forgive me. How can I explain to them that while praying to God is good and noble, they still need the sacrament of reconciliation? Good question, Frank. All right, first of all, this is uh, a question I had, uh, a related question I had earlier in the day in which somebody uh, had asked me, well, where in the Bible is there a distinction between venial sin and mortal sin? Well, somebody who has to ask that doesn't know their Bible. And that would be in First letter of St. John, chapter 5, beginning with verse 16, um, where it says, If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a deadly sin, he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal or not deadly. Okay? There it is. Deadly is the Anglo-Saxon word, mortal is the Latin word, same thing, that's all. So there is sin that is not deadly, and for that you can pray. In fact, as the Catechism says, uh, I think it's about 1864, no, 1864 or so, um, that when you go to Mass, that is good for forgiving venial sins. But then he goes on to say, there is sin which is deadly. I do not say that one is to pray for that. So mortal sin you don't pray for. So your friend is partly right. You pray for venial sins and, and pray for one another to be, get the strength overcome and that make an, an act of contrition and be truly sorry for the venial sin and it's forgiven. And, but you don't pray for mortal sin. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not deadly, and therefore some which is mortal. So there's a, now they don't use the word venial. That came la later as the church you know, in the West used the word venial for, for certain kinds of, uh, of sins, lesser sins. But there's a difference between mortal and venial. So what do we do then? We confess. That's what, you, you pray for venial sins and confess, you know, especially mass at the confession rite and so on. But mortal sin, you have to go to confession. That's why Jesus, and, and, and again, it's, you're not arguing with me. I'm not the one who's the problem. It's Jesus who said on Easter Sunday night, I'll never forget it. I was in, in a, an airplane and I heard a guy saying that behind me. 
um, you know, that, uh, no, I, I'm, I was raised Catholic, but now I'm beyond that. I don't feel any more guilt. And so I, um, I, I don't need to go to confession. And, uh, and, and I made some comments about something else. When we got off the plane, we just were coming to the gate. So as we got off the plane, I said, uh, and he mentioned that his mother watched EWTN. So I said, thank your mother for me for watching EWTN. We appreciate it. But as for you, don't you ever bad mouth confession again. Jesus Christ established it on the night he rose from the dead when he said to his holy apostles, whose ever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose ever sins you retain, they are retained. How can I know whether to forgive or retain unless you tell me what they are and what your motives are? And as far as confessing, well, I don't confess to a mere man. I confess directly to God. Well, that's an interesting argument, and that argument is found in the Bible. Did you know that? That argument's in the Bible. It's used by the Pharisees because Jesus was forgiving sins. And you see that in Mark chapter 2, verse 6. The scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like this? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Look, if you want to use the Pharisees' arguments against Jesus as your own arguments against confession, see where it gets you. But I'm going to follow what our Savior did in giving us confession, and uh, this is what we uh, want to do, that if he could forgive sins, then we want the forgiveness of sin. So, and especially for mortal sin. Don't be going to Holy Communion if you have mortal sin on your soul. You know, we all do inadvertent sins and sins that we didn't really, you know, that, that have a lesser effect and lesser uh, uh, potency to them. They're not grave matter. But um, um, this is something that, uh, you know, we still, it's a good idea to confess. As a matter of fact, I've come across people who are married. Well, I'm married and I don't need to go to confession. No. See, fornication was not the only sin you ever had to confess. If you don't believe me, now ask your spouse what you think you should confess. They will be willing to give you a list because they know better. Uh, you should go to confession more so that your relationship with your spouse is more and more healed by asking God to come into it. So, but uh, definitely for mortal sins, go to confession and venial sins. Um, you still can use it now and again and uh, also come to Mass and have your sins forgiven there. All right, we'll take a break. We'll be coming, starting off with a call from Paula from Indiana and any other questions that we have. So please stay with us. On the anniversary of Mother Angelica's death, join EWTN and the Franciscan Friars of the Eternal Word as we honor our Founder's life as a Bride of Christ and follow the painful journey Jesus suffered for us all. From Our Lady of the Angels Chapel, the Stations of the Cross on the anniversary of Mother Angelica's passing. Today at 4 p.m. Eastern, here on EWTN. Solemn voices echo throughout Washington, D.C.'s National Shrine in remembrance of the events of Holy Week and in commemoration of Christ's last meeting with His disciples that night when our Lord instituted the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood. On Holy Thursday, celebrate the Paschal Banquet, His body and blood sacrificed for all. Choral Meditations and the Solemn Mass of the Lord's Supper Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. In silence and adoration at the rock that witnessed the blood-drenched sweat of our Lord, we live the night of Christ's agony when our Savior prayed, Not my will, but thine be done. 
the hour of his betrayal has come. Praying with Jesus in the Garden of Olives from the Basilica of the Agony in Jerusalem, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. The 2018 Cool to be Catholic Commercial Contest winners have been selected. Meet them and check out their amazing work on a special edition of Life on the Rock on Easter Sunday. That's Sunday, April 1st at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. All right, we are ready to take a caller. Hello, Paula. Yes. Where are you calling from? Myland, Indiana. Good to have you. And what is your question? Well, I heard a priest once say that if a person had lived an excellent life, all their life they were good, and then one Sunday they decide they just don't want to go to Mass. There's no good reason for it. They just don't want to go. Mm -hmm. And then they die. Well, they're going to go to hell because they died with mortal sin on their soul. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how much of their life they lived as a good person. Mm -hmm. But that just sounds awfully harsh. Yeah, hey, it is. Mercy would come in there, wouldn't it? Maybe. And maybe not. And here's Paul. Let me, let me read you a passage from another priest. I don't know who that priest was, but I know who this one is. It's a priest named Ezekiel the prophet. He was a priest from Jerusalem who had been taken into exile into, uh, into Babylon in the year 598 BC. And he, uh, here the Lord speaks through him and says, but when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does the same abominable things that the wicked man does, shall he live and the answer is, none of the righteous deeds which he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, he shall die. Then in verse 25, think about this with your question. The prophet then says, yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O Israel, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Now, the Lord God, uh, uh, and matter of fact, he, that same objection that you're bringing up was brought up about tw 2,000 uh, and, uh, let's see, about 500 and almost, fi almost 2,600 years ago. Exactly the same thing. What is at stake there, Paula? When we're dealing with our love of the Lord, we're not dealing with a juridical relationship where it's a law court that you weigh things. That was the Egyptian approach. They believed that when you died, and you may have seen pictures of the Egyptian book of the dead, they would have a scale and they would put all of your good deeds on one side of the scale and then a feather on the other. And you had to at least make the feather balance with your, with your good deeds. But that's not the way that it is because it's not that kind of negotiation. It's rather that it's a relationship. I'll give you a, an example of how this applies in human relationships. A man and a woman married for many years, all of a sudden, after 30 years of marriage, he falls madly in lust with another woman and runs off with her. Does that mean, therefore, well, you know, he was so good, it doesn't matter. I don't know many wives that would say it's okay, I, nor should they, because it has disrupted the relationship, which is an ongoing relationship of commitment and the mortal sin, whether it be missing mass on Sunday willfully, no, not just by sickness or something like that, but a willful missing of mass, that disrupts the relationship. 
that you have. And that's why the earlier stuff doesn't count. You know, uh, if a man cheats on his wife and, uh, you know, just sort of comes home, well, honey, I've loved you all these other times. It's okay, isn't it? Uh, no. Now, if he repents, uh, then she may take him in. But then she'll also probably want to have some evidence that the repentance and the change of behavior is real before she lets him in, which makes sense, you know, and so also with the Lord. But see it in terms of that disruption of a relationship rather than a balance like the Egyptians did. Okay? All right. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from well, or hold that close to you. From yeah. Orlando, Florida. Orlando, great. And it's a nice town. And uh, what's your question? Well, on our Father prayer, uh, does, when he says, Hallowed be thy name, mm -hmm. does it imply I am or Jave as the name? Or, or what is it? Okay. As a matter of fact, no. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say that, don't they? Yes. Uh, you know why they say that? Their organization makes that up. It's not, there, you know, we have, you know, uh, 3,000 very ancient manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek and other languages. And we have thousands more besides that that are a little bit not quite so ancient. Now, there's no book like that. I mean, for instance, with the Quran, you don't have any copies of the Quran until 200 years after Muhammad died. There's not one. So, you know, the, the New Testament has very good documentary attestation, okay? Not one manuscript ever has the, the divine name in it. When it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's the name? Father. That's the name that is sanctified or hallowed. That's why, keep in mind what Jesus our Lord taught in John 17. Father, keep them one by your name. What name? The name Father. This is, that's what is going on there. Our Lord Jesus takes us even deeper. Just as in the Old Testament, you see some of the uh, early passages speak about Elohim, God. Then there's a development. You see that he reveals himself as El Shaddai, God Almighty. And then in, you see in Exodus 6, where it says, I used to be called El Shaddai, now I'm called Yahweh. And now Jesus has taken it to another level of intimacy where we call God Father because we are adopted children. And that what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit, uh, especially in Romans 8 and in Galatians chapter 4, says the Holy Spirit within us cries out, Abba, Father. That's the name that's sanctified. And that's what Christ has given. Rabbis didn't teach that God was called Father. That wasn't part of the tradition. Christ introduces that as the deepening of it. And that's the holy name um, that, and he also says in John 17, Father, sanctify them by your name. Your name, Father, makes them holy. That's why some of these folks who were calling themselves feminists and stuff and trying to change the name from father to other things were making a horrible mistake. It's so bad in some churches, some of the denominations that said, well, we're going to let them sort of have their way. They came up with nine different ways to do baptism because they can't agree on what to call father. When they reject the name father, they cannot maintain unity. Je that's why Jesus had said, father, keep them one by your name. Father, sanctify them by your name. And the Jehovah's Witnesses would cause their own splits too. Okay, so now, nah. <clears throat> all right, and then uh, we have a question uh, from Catherine that's coming to us from Facebook. Uh, Father Mitch, how do you fight 
habitual sins. These are the ones we keep doing over and over again. Um, well, there's one of the things when you have a habitual sin, um, and, and also she adds, it's hard to believe when confessing them time and again that, you know, uh, we need forgiveness. So one of the things that we have to do with habitual sins, uh, oh, and, and she also has trouble believing that the confession can be valid, but she does it over and over again. Um, here's the, 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 the issue. First, with habitual sins, one of the tasks is to come up with new habits. You have an old habit of committing a sin, come up with a new habit that is an antidote. So I'll give you uh, an example. <clears throat> Sometimes people have problems with using bad words. All right, instead of using those bad words, when something bad happens, learn to praise God instead of cussing. That's an antidote. It does the opposite. You just say, I got to stop cussing. No, I'm going to praise Jesus and give glory to God when I hit my finger. Now, it takes a little while to do that so in something, but it really is a helpful antidote. And you know, I know people have uh, uh, habits of pornography. What do you do? Say the Divine Mercy Chaplet for the people you are tempted to look at and do the opposite. And that's something that uh, would be a, a good antidote. All right, and then let's go to another call. We have Patricia in California. Patricia, what is your question? Good morning, Father. Hi, Good what can we do? Here. Yeah, right, what can we do for you? I have just a I minute, just Patricia. I, okay, um, a deacon at my church explained to me that after we confess our sins, and do a good penance mm -hmm. that we still have to spend time in purgatory paying for mm -hmm. the same sins we just confessed. Yeah. Is this true? Okay. And if so why would we have to pay for our sins a second time? Okay. All right. Here's, here's a way to understand that. He's got, he's, he's got a point. You may or may not. You can do penance here on earth because it's not only confessing the sin that I did, but there are also the effects effects of a sin. So I remember one time I was, uh, our house was robbed uh, when I lived in a community in Chicago. You don't feel safe in your own house after that. And so how do you make up for that? How does the thief make up for our lack uh, of security in our own home? Or when somebody punches you, you still have the black eye. You need to deal with the effects of the sins. So it's not that the sins are being paid for. Christ paid for that, but the effects of the sins. And that's why we do penance after the confession and why we continue to work on correcting those bad behaviors. That's the, the task that we have. And that's why we'd go to, if there's some things that are not reconciled yet, that'll be dealt with in purgatory. Sometimes you can be sorry you were angry, but when you see that person again, you sort of get all tense. That has to be dealt with in purgatory. We'll finish it off. But I'm afraid I'm finished off. Uh, we have run out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Make sure you go to the services this week, especially Holy Thursday, Good Friday, if you can on Holy Saturday, and Easter, and get the confession if you haven't been there in a while. All right? God bless you all, and have a wonderful celebration of Holy Week and of Easter. Thank you. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, next here on EWTN. We are all called to be great saints, especially in this day and age when we have to fight for our faith. Don't miss the opportunity. The path to sanctity may be narrow, 
But Mother Angelica can help you answer God's transforming call with Mother Angelica's Guide to Practical Holiness. In this collection of many books, see why a holy life is not just a privilege for a chosen few, but part of God's plan for you. Mother shares ways to grow in holiness every day, why the saints can be our guides, God's will, and more. Be holy wherever you are with Mother Angelica's Guide to Practical Holiness. New from EWT and Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com. Solemn voices echo throughout Washington, D.C.'s National Shrine in remembrance of the events of Holy Week and in commemoration of Christ's last meeting with His disciples that night when our Lord instituted the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood. On Holy Thursday, celebrate the Paschal Banquet, His body and blood sacrificed for all. Choral Meditations and the Solemn Mass of the Lord's Supper. Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic.